Classic endocrine glands lack ducts, and their secretions, hormones, enter the surrounding vasculature or lymphatic circulation. Their component cells present a relatively simple organization into either clumps, follicles, cords, or plates of cells enveloped by delicate vascular connective tissue. The endocrine glands in this particular exercise include the pineal gland, the parathyroid glands, the thyroid gland, the adrenal glands, and the pituitary gland or hypophysis. Learning objectives for the classic endocrine glands in this particular segment. 1. Be able to recognize and describe the histological details of the pineal gland. 2. Be able to recognize and describe the histological details of the parathyroid glands. 3. Be able to recognize and describe the histological details of the thyroid gland and be able to relate the cytological observations made to the function of this particular organ. 4. Be able to recognize and describe the histological details of the adrenal glands. Be able to describe the vasculature associated with these glands and be able to relate the histological observations made to the functions of the various subdivisions within these glands. And 5. Be able to recognize and describe the histological details characteristic of each major subdivision of the pituitary gland or hypothesis. Be able to relate the histological observations made to the functional significance of each major subdivision. This particular section is a relatively decent uh, sample of a human pineal gland uh, as seen with the low power objective. Notice that the gland is surrounded or uh, enveloped by a thin connective tissue capsule that is intimately associated with adjacent uh, peel tissue uh, the inner meninge as shown here, this vascularized structure that's been pulled off a little bit. Here we can see a little bit of capsule and it course, of course, it's coursing along the external uh, surface of the gland. Here perhaps is a little bit better uh, demonstration of the surrounding capsule. It'll send connective tissue septae that subdivide the gland into these various smaller lobular units. This would be uh, uh, enveloping peel tissue here. As one uh, courses and looks more into the parenchyma of the gland, one can visualize outlined by the connective tissue and nerve fibers and vasculature entering this particular uh, gland what appear to be small, irregularly shaped, variously sized uh, lobules. Uh, one that's fairly well uh, outlined is shown here and is being traced by the pointer. And one get, can get vague impressions of these elsewhere. These particular structures here is the so-called brain sand or corpora arenacea. Uh, this calcium phosphate uh, type of material is crystalline structure that is uh, in sort of an organic uh, type of a matrix. And as we course around the gland, you can see this histological organization repeats itself once and again. And one can make out these big uh, lobules that we will see in just a moment is made up of both a cell type known as a pinealocyte and then uh, glial cells as well. And here are some more uh, of this infiltration of this brain sand or these uh, calcium phosphate crystals within an organic matrix, these corpora arenacea, as illustrated here, these gray uh, uh, looking bodies in this particular section, some of which will become quite large and shatter uh, due to the histological preparation. Now we're coursing on the external surface of the gland, uh, once again, seeing the capsule and the surrounding peel uh, tissue. If we course up 
uh, above and away from the gland, we can see we get into brain tissue here. So this is a fairly decent section through the entire length of a pineal. If we course down to this region here on the other surface, this is sort of the pineal stock region. Uh, so you get uh, this connective tissue looking type of material is actually uh, postganglionic uh, sympathetic fibers coming from that superior cervical gland, or not gland, uh, ganglion, excuse me, as well as uh, a considerable amount of vasculature. After all, this is an endocrine organ. So now let's go down, having seen and, and sort of perused around the entire pineal body. Uh, as we're doing here, noting its caps, surrounding capsule, its association with peel tissue and lobules, uh, briefly uh, look at some of the histological details uh, of some of these lobules, as well as look at some of the corpora aranacea at increased magnification. This is a segment of the pineal, human pineal gland seen at a slight increased magnification to simply to illustrate the formation of these irregularly shaped uh, lobules as, as being traced by the pointer. And they're sort of outlined not only by connective tissue but by myelinated, unmyelinated nerves, excuse me, and vasculature uh, coming in and separating uh, this particular gland into these uh, lobules or lobule-like structures. And we shall see in a, uh, just uh, very shortly uh, that these lobules consist of two primary cell types. The most predominant one is the pinealocyte and then finally uh, supporting glial uh, type cells. And once again here we're getting into a region, uh, a fairly decent region that shows the uh, brain sand these gray-blue crystalline looking uh, type of structures, the uh, corpora aranacea. Uh, so let's look for the details of these cells briefly at a higher magnification. The pineal, uh, human pineal seen at uh, high powered magnification showing the uh, corpora aranacea, these crystalline homogeneous and irregularly shaped structures as uh, filling the field uh, right now, although scattered within it. These would be the corpora aranacea here. And if we go back to this single uh, lobule uh, here, as indicated by the arrow, one can see the organization of the um, pinealocytes, these sort of larger uh, less dense uh, nucleated cells at this location is being traced by the pointer. And you can see these particular cells are sending numerous processes out towards the uh, periphery of this particular uh, lobule. With special staining, we could trace these processes out a considerable distance and they would sort of end in these club-like endings that were uh, discussed in uh, lecture or shown or at least illustrated in lecture. And at this increase in magnification you can see the repeating nature of the pineal made up of these irregularly shaped lobules and the predominant and most numerous cell type being these uh, pinealocytes. Uh, let me see if I can find a, a little bit better illustration to show individual cells at a slightly higher magnification. Some of the pinealocytes as seen at increased uh, magnification, these are the nuclei of the pinealocytes. And some of these cytoplasmic extensions you can uh, make out are these long processes that are going to this paravascular space. You can see a little few red cells within this capillary lumen, so they're tending to run in that uh, direction towards the vasculature. It's these types of processes then when uh, one uses special stains that can be shown to terminate in these bulbous-like uh, uh, types of endings. 
But nonetheless, these are the processes, as indicated by the arrow, that are extending away from the cell body, which is over here, and sort of lined up in a row uh, with these cells of the pinealocytes. Their process is going this way towards that vascular space. And they'll probably send other processes in towards the center of the lobule as well. So one can uh, be fairly confident most of these very large uh, looking nuclei, such as indicated by the pointer associated with these processes, are indeed the pineolocytes. A very smaller, uh, denser type of nuclei that are about half the size are uh, undoubtedly those associated with the supporting glial cells. They are much fewer in number uh, than the pineolocytes and a little bit harder uh, to find, but I think these perhaps and uh, nuclei such as those, those smaller dense ones, are uh, the glial or supporting elements. So this is uh, about all one can uh, visualize on this very, very poorly understood uh, endocrine gland, the pineal. Uh, consists of two cell types, the pinealocyte with its uh, sort of elongated processes that end in those bulb-like endings next to other pinealocytes or the paravascular space as shown along here. Uh, it is supported and nurtured by, with glial cells and together those two cell types, the pinealocyte and glial cells, are organized into these lobules and several lobules uh, make up the gland. Remember this is a uh, photoendocrine type of uh, gland. It's receiving signals uh, via the retina, sort of uh, from the light, and uh, through a series of uh, neuron chains, uh, the uh, superior cervical ganglion will send uh, postganglionic sympathetic fibers uh, that innervate and control uh, the secretion of this gland. The principal uh, hormone secreted by the pineal in human beings is melatonin. This particular section is representative of a low-powered view of the parathyroid uh, gland. Notice that it does have, in this particular case, perhaps a little thin capsule, and that it's made up of these anastomosing cords or plates of cells without really any uh, apparent organization. Uh, you have a quite a bit of connective tissue uh, sort of subdividing, breaking up uh, the epithelial component of this particular gland. And one can see even at this magnification as one would anticipate uh, blood vessels of uh, pretty good uh, caliber as this is a scanning uh, view with the low-powered objective. These are all uh, blood vessels uh, that are permeating this particular gland. So indeed it is a very vascular structure as would one would anticipate it being an endocrine gland. So uh, a characteristic feature of uh, this particular gland is sort of its lack of organization, I guess. Uh, a sort of a parenchymous looking uh, gland from this particular magnification that of course lacks ducts because it is an endocrine organ. Now interestingly enough, uh, this has to be taken from a fairly young individual as uh, there's uh, a very little fat or adipose tissue associated with it. The other interesting uh, feature that should be brought to your attention is that even with the scanning mode, in this particular case one can make out some clusters of these uh, eosinophilic uh, groups of cells. These are uh, undoubtedly uh, oxyophils. We'll have to go down and confirm that, of course. But the bulk of the parathyroid, as one can uh, see, if in that is indeed the case, is made up of another cell type, and that should be the uh, chief cell. Here another is another uh, sort of clump or nest or accumulation of what uh, appears to be the oxyophil cells. Now, in a parathyroid gland from an older individual, uh, uh, the next 
numerous cell type to the chief cell, I would guess, would be the adipocyte, because they can constitute a uh, considerable volume of the parathyroid uh, gland. That region of the parathyroid gland that was uh, examined at the scanning mode, showing this cluster of cells here, the majority of which uh, are the uh, oxyophils. The chief cells, of course, are making up the uh, majority of the parathyroid, and uh, this is their appearance. And they're best uh, uh, viewed and examined at a higher magnification. That same region of the parathyroid gland as seen at uh, a slight increase in magnification or a higher magnification. These cell types here, as indicated by the arrow with the acidophilic cytoplasm, are the oxyophils. Here's one where I can put the tip of the arrow on its nucleus. Its cytoplasm goes about this far. So these are typical oxyophils filled with mitochondria, and hence their uh, eosinophilic staining. Here's another fairly good example of a very typical oxyophils with a round sort of pycnotic nucleus, and one can make out, in this case, the uh, cytoplasmic uh, boundaries of these fairly uh, large cells. Compare this t cell type, that is the oxyophil, with the cell type thought to be secreting the parathyroid hormone of this gland, the chief cell. Uh, sort of a, a smaller, uh, more vacuolated or empty appearing cell that's making up the majority of this particular gland. The reason it has this vacuolated, sort of empty appearance to it is because it is loaded with glycogen and small uh, fat droplets, and uh, due to processing, these are usually leached out and gives you this sort of empty, vacuolated appearance. But this now is the parenchyma of the parathyroid gland as seen at uh, increased magnification. The majority of cells are indeed uh, the chief cells, these vacuolated empty ones, and scattered within the parenchyma of these chief cells, one will continue to find the oxyophils. Another fairly decent example of an oxyophil is shown here, with a sort of denser pycnotic nucleus and, of course, a characteristic acidophilic uh, cytoplasm, or eosinophilic, however you would like to uh, choose to describe it. Here, once again, are the uh, oxyophils scattered around uh, within the parenchyma of this particular organ. So once you see this type of an organization, plus the two cell types, the chief cells, and in particular the oxyophils, one realizes immediately these are the characteristic features that one is dealing with the uh, parathyroid uh, gland. If this were an older specimen or a specimen from an older individual, excuse me, uh, then another very uh, prominent cell type that would come into the field would be that of the uh, fat cell or the epitocyte. This particular field is a relatively low power uh, field of the thyroid gland characterized by follicles. So the substructure of this particular gland, its glandular organization is not plates or anastomosis and cords, but these basketball type structures as seen in section uh, the thyroid follicles. The uh, follicular cells form a single layer of cells uh, that form the wall of the follicle, and the orangish reddish type of material uh, as indicated by the pointer is the colloid within the lumen of these particular follicles. Notice that the follicles vary considerably uh, in size, fairly large one here, and yet you get other smaller looking follicles as well. The thyroid itself is are surrounded by a capsule, and you can see the intervening uh, vascularized connective tissue uh, lying between uh, individual uh, follicles. So the thyroid repeats itself over and over again, uh, I mean its substructure, and consists of these uh, follicles of variable size 
all of which show the same uh, histological uh, makeup that is around, lined by a single layer of cells that may be variable in height depending on its activity with intervening uh, connective tissue. Now let's go down and, and examine uh, one or two of these follicles at increased magnification. This is an extremely high magnification uh, picture of some adjacent follicles to illustrate the vasculature associated with the thyroid follicles. This thin line of uh, orange material or pink material here that stains very similar to the colloid is in fact red cells going through the capillary system. Another red cell is shown here. The vessel is curving this way. It's here. It's here. It's here. It's up there. And then on the adjacent follicle you can see a capillary uh, at that location. You can see red cells uh, here, up here. And so as one would expect, the follicle is extraordinarily uh, well vascularized and it's like covering a basketball if these were considered basketball or spherical round structures with a uh, fish net. Uh, each cell has access to the blood uh, vascular or lymphatic circulation so these follicles, thyroid follicles, are completely enveloped uh, by a blood vascular uh, system as can be illustrated in this particular uh, field quite well. Uh, so that will be associated uh, with all of them. That's again uh, just to point these vascular elements out at uh, all capillaries completely enveloping the uh, thyroid follicles. These thyroid follicles were taken from an individual that was fairly inactive, a quiescent, uh, so they're fairly low, almost squamous to uh, cuboidal uh, uh, in most instances, uh, but please do bear in mind they can range in height, that is the surrounding follicular cells making up these thyroid follicles, all the way from uh, a squamous like is shown here, or low cuboidal, to a fairly tall cuboidal and then some of the very active forms are very tall columnar uh, follicular uh, epithelium. Again, thyroid follicles seen at a relatively low magnification at the edge of the thyroid gland itself, uh, this being the, uh, a sort of a thin surrounding capsule. Each one of these, again, to repeat our thyroid follicles and their wall is formed by the follicular cells, uh, which in this case they're sort of a low uh, cuboidal to almost a squamous type form. Now searching in between in the intervening interfollicular uh, connective uh, tissue, one should also search for the parafollicular cells or the C cells or the light cells. And one can see we just by chance happened on a very large cluster of these parafollicular uh, cells and as shown at the uh, tip of the pointer. So the cells that line the follicles themselves are referred to as follicular cells. The cells that lie between and around the follicles are parafollicular cells. Oftentimes, more often than not, they are, do not occur in these clusters or nests, but occur as individuals lying just outside of the follicular wall. And perhaps we'll uh, attempt to find one of those as well for demonstration purposes. But for now, compare the morphology uh, in addition to the position of parafollicular cells with uh, follicular cells. The parafollicular cells are usually quite a bit larger have this fried egg appearance with a considerable amount of very light staining uh, cytoplasm, and hence their name light cell uh, as well. As compared to the follicular lining cells, the nuclei, which are usually more uh, heterochromatic uh, and uh, darker staining uh, in most 
preparations. Okay. This is a section of human thyroid that's been stained immunocytochemically or immunohistochemically to demonstrate uh, thyroglobulin uh, down in the clinic. You can see some of the cells and the thyroglobulin immunoreactivity is demonstrated by the sort of black uh, spots or black type of precipitous type of material in this particular section. Here you can see this particular cell, uh, follicular cell of this thyroid follicle uh, as indicated by the arrow that's very, very dark and active in the synthesis of thyroglobulin. You can see some of the other cells also are active or perhaps all of them are active to some degree, some simply containing more of the thyroglobulin uh, than others. Uh, uh, this type of a cell here, and then the ones at the, some of the follicular cells at the bottom also are very, very active uh, in this endeavor. And if one just quickly looks at, uh, here are a couple more uh, smallish uh, types of uh, thyroid follicles, uh, one shown here, uh, one shown here, also which are extremely active and contain a considerable amount of the uh, uh, thyroglobulin uh, molecule. And this repeats itself uh, over and over again. All uh, seem to show a little uh, somewhat some degree of activity, uh, with some of the smaller uh, follicles being more active than others, uh, particularly these uh, two smallish uh, thyroid follicles uh, at this location. So this is an immunohistochemical profile uh, done in the clinic of human thyroid uh, demonstrating the presence of uh, thyroglobulin uh, within the uh, follicular cells. The parafollicular cells seen at increased magnification, illustrating those features that were just described, the nucleus being here, very light, a light euchromatic type of nucleus, and the cytoplasm is quite abundant and extends out about to where the tip of the pointer is indicating. So this is a cluster or a nest of the parafollicular cells. Please recall that the parafollicular cell is involved in uh, calcium homeostasis. It is, uh, produces uh, the polypeptide calcitonin or thyrocalcitonin and helps suppress the high levels of calcium ion uh, secretion and acts counter to that of the parathyroid hormone. Both the parathyroid gland and these thyrocalcitonin uh, secreting cells, that is the parafollicular cells, respond uh, or are controlled by, that is their secretion is controlled by the level of calcium ion uh, concentration uh, within the plasma. On the other hand, uh, are producing thyroid hormone uh, thyroxin or T4, as well as uh, a little bit of uh, T3, which when we released into the surrounding vasculature and bound to a, a transporting uh, a binding uh, protein to get wherever it's going and to be held on to until it's needed. This particular cell is under the secretory control of thyroid stimulating uh, hormone which is coming from a thyrotroph located in the pituitary gland, uh, one of the basophil uh, cell types. So this is the uh, thyroid gland, and I'm just cruising around looking for uh, a few isolated uh, parafollicular cells. Now that the morphology was easily identified by, by a chance encounter of one of the larger groups 
of these uh, particular cells, hoping to find one that's more or less isolated in the uh, tissue in the wall of the follicle, along the wall of the follicle, I should say, or in the uh, intervening connective tissue, which is their, uh, where they're, how they're seen uh, most often in uh, human tissue. This particular cell type shown at the tip of the pointer with its euchromatic appearing nucleus and relatively abundant cytoplasm right here is a parafollicular cell and one that is how they're more often uh, times observed or seen. Isolated uh, and scattered uh, in the connective tissue uh, between the thyroid follicles rather than occurring in those large nests. You can see its cytoplasm extends down uh, this far. Uh, this orangey type of material that's uh, adjacent to it happen to be, happens to be a series of erythrocytes coursing in a vessel uh, taking an angle uh, such as uh, that. So it too has direct access uh, to the uh, vasculature. Oftentimes one will see these in small groups of two or three uh, or singly, uh, unlike the situation we encountered and demonstrated earlier in which there was a huge cluster of these parafollicular or C or light uh, cells, the thyrocalcitonin uh, producing cells. An additional excellent example of a parafollicular cell, as indicated by the pointer, as it's nestling up against a uh, thyroid follicle uh, at this particular location and another one uh, situated here. Identified immediately by its euchromatic type of nucleus and the lighter, clearer uh, standing cytoplasm as indicated by the pointer which has, is of a considerable uh, volume. So it's recognized quite uh, readily. Uh, in addition to this particular one, there are two or three other uh, parafollicular cells at this location and as indicated uh, by the pointer, adjacent to uh, this particular uh, small follicle. Now this is the more typical situation one will encounter uh, the parafollicular cells as uh, was mentioned uh, earlier. And here are uh, probably less dramatic, uh, a few other examples of the uh, parafollicular cells. They no never border the lumen of the follicle, the actual thyroid follicle, but may be sandwiched or nestled up uh, immediately adjacent uh, to the follicle itself. And once again, one can make out the intense vasculature associated uh, with the particular follicle in the upper center uh, point in the field of view, as well as uh, the other uh, follicles as well, uh, as this is an extraordinarily uh, vascular tissue. This is a section of the adrenal gland as seen with the scanning objective and the specimen stain with the hematoxylin and eosin stain as was true of the um, other endocrine organ stain thus far. This region as outlined and indicated by the pointer is the cortex of the adrenal gland and one can make out with close observation a relatively thin capsule uh, of connective tissue uh, right about where the tip of the pointer is that it's uh, relatively unstained. Larger blood vessels are up in the surrounding connective tissue. This light area occupying the center, or the lower portion of the field of view of this uh, particular organ is the adrenal medulla made up of these large light staining uh, chromophin cells. And one can also make out at this scanning, with the scanning objective, these large areas uh, with, uh, filled with blood. These are the uh, central uh, medullary veins that will eventually coalesce 
to form the suprarenal vein that will drain and exit out of uh, the adrenal gland, draining the entire structure. So coursing through on the opposite side, once again we uh, have more uh, cortical area, so this would be uh, adrenal cortex beginning here and extending to this point, and one can make out uh, the connective tissue capsule uh, perhaps a little bit uh, better. Here we have a large vessel that's actually entering uh, the uh, gland per se, and right now the tip of the pointer is on the surrounding uh, capsule. You can see it has a few uh, nerves and blood vessels associated uh, with it. Perhaps the capsule is pulled a little bit uh, off uh, on this particular side. We're just coursing now around looking at the cortex and uh, lighter staining medulla is indicated by the point here of this particular uh, section. And then, of course, the tissue is cut here, so we're only getting a portion of the entire uh, structure. Even at this magnification, in addition to the adrenal medulla as indicated uh, by the pointer, the three zones of the adrenal uh, cortex can be distinguished even with the scanning uh, objective. This much thinner layer here in which the cells are organized into little loops or arcades uh, that area that lies between the tip of the pointer and the outer capsule, which is here, is the zona glomerulosa. The larger of the zones, which extends from where the tip of the pointer is now indicating to uh, the level shown now, is the zona fasciculata, and that region that lies between the medulla and the zona fasciculata is the zona reticularis. Please do remember that it is this zone, that is the zona glomerulosa, that is responsible for uh, mineral corticoid, mainly aldosterone. The much larger, thicker layer of the three, the zona uh, fasciculata, is primarily for glucocorticoids, and then the androgens uh, primarily coming from the zona reticularis, though the latter two zones, steroid hormones, uh, of both types, that is, uh, androgens and glucocorticoids are probably coming from both cell types, though one zone uh, perhaps ha the uh, steroid, the glucocoid, for example, of the uh, zona fasciculata is the more predominant steroid uh, with a minor component of androgens, and the zona reticularis, the major component, is probably androgens probably with a, a smaller amount of uh, glucocorticoid uh, being produced by those particular cells. A region of the uh, adrenal cortex showing in greater detail, or at least at ha higher magnification, the appearance of the zona glomerulosa, organized into arcades or loops of cells which are slightly smaller, uh, that is, the cells, than those uh, adrenocortical cells found in the zona fasciculata. So this gives you an idea, or one an idea, of the arrangement of the cells in the zona uh, glomerulosa. And they extend from about from here, to where the arrow is now indicating, to the capsule, which is shown here. The much larger zone of larger cells now occupying the entire field of view and has a more cord-like uh, appearance, or at least the uh, cells are more organized into more elongated uh, types of cords or structures similar to the uh, hepatic cords uh, are the cells of the zona fasciculata, and they extend down to about uh, this location, 
oftentimes are characterized by abundance of lipid droplets which uh, have a vacuolated appearance in this particular uh, section because the uh, lipid type of material, fat droplets, have been leached out due to processing. So that, that zone beneath that, without the lipid droplets, and the cells get slightly smaller and sort of have an anastomosing, more irregular appearance rather than the elongated cords, is the zona uh, reticularis. So that would be this particular zone as indicated uh, by the arrow. And then as we course continue to course to the interior of the adrenal, these large light staining cells are the chromaffin cells uh, or the adrenal medullary cells that are responsible for producing the catecholamines, uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine. And in the case of the human being, it's epinephrine that is the predominant uh, catecholamine uh, being released. A view of the uh, adrenal medullary cells or chromophon cells seen at increased uh, magnification. Very light staining cytoplasm, a euchromatic uh, type of nucleus. The entire field is made up of these adrenal medullary cells or chromophon cells to illustrate those cytological uh, features. Cells of the zona glomerulosa, as seen at increased magnification, simply to show their organization into these whorls or, or sort of like loops and indicate that they are indeed uh, smaller in size when one compares them to the underlying cells, uh, adrenal cortical cells, making up the zona fasciculata. So this group of cells from about this point towards the capsule are cells of the zona glomerulosa. Cells where the tip of the pointer now resides going towards the uh, bottom of the field of view are the cells forming the zona fasciculata as seen at increased uh, magnification. Uh, quite a bit larger, organizing into the straight fascicles or columns of cells and the appearance, or more abundant appearance, of lipid droplets. Although it's not illustrated here, please do remember the blood vascular system of this particular organ. These fascicles or cords of cells are separated by sinusoids, a fenestrated type of epithelium, and the blood vascular is draining from the capsule through the glomerulosa all the way through the cortex through these sinusoids and collecting in the medullary veins. So the flow is from the periphery towards the center, towards the medulla, collects in a large central vein, and then exits uh, the uh, adrenal gland through the suprarenal vein. Unfortunately, this, uh, these features or the vascular elements cannot be demonstrated well on this particular uh, preparation. Uh, reasons for which I have no explanation. The vasculature just seems to have uh, collapsed. One can get a hint of that. These are endothelial cells with a few uh, remnants of some red cells going through. Another example is shown here. So it can be uh, seen somewhat, but not how it really should be if we had a, an excellent preparation for demonstration. These are all cells of the uh, zona uh, fasciculata, and then finally we get down near the medulla, they get smaller once again, are not organized into the straight fascicles, forming an anastomosing network, and this, seen at increased magnification, is typical of the zona reticularis. Uh, these particular cells here, as indicated by the pointer. This is a section through the midline region of a human pituitary gland or hypothesis. This particular uh, section is stained with one of the combination stains to demonstrate the various uh, epithelial cell types associated with the uh, 
pituitary, particularly the adenohypophysis. Uh, that stain is an aldehyde fusin PAS orange G light green uh, stain. So it's one of those trichrome stains uh, used to differentiate the cell types, or it was. What this slide indicates quite well are the various subcomponents of the uh, pituitary gland. And it's more or less orientated in its proper perspective with the posterior region, if it were sitting in the cell of torsia, being located at where the arrow now indicates this region uh, would be anterior. So remember that the pituitary or hypothesis consists of two major subcomponents, a neural component and a, an epithelial component uh, that makes up the adenohypothesis. So what can be seen if we consider the neural hypothesis first is the infundibular stock, as indicated by the arrow, coming down and then expanding out and forming the posterior lobe of the pituitary, oftentimes referred to as the pars nervosa. What's missing and making up the third component of the uh, neural hypothesis would be the median eminence, that funnel-like extension uh, coming from the uh, floor of the hypothalamus and then uh, becoming continuous with the infundibular stock and then finally the neural hypothesis. So those would be the three components of the neural subdivision or the neural component of the pituitary. Now the epithelial component of the pituitary consists of a narrow band of cells, the first component uh, that wraps around or partially around the uh, infundibular stock. So this is the region of the pars tuberalis, as indicated by the arrow. It expands into the major component of the adenohypothesis, the anterior lobe of the pituitary, more often referred to as the pars distalis, as indicated by the arrow. And in human beings, uh, the pars intermedia, the third component of the uh, adenohypothesis is relatively rudimentary and hard to see. It consists of a few layers of cells that are lie upon this uh, wall, as indicated by the arrow, of the pars nervosa, or the posterior lobe. They seem, the pars intermedia, that is, is separated from the pars distalis by a series of cysts one of which large ones is indicated by the pointer that run along this area between the pars nervosa and the pars distalis. And these are thought to be remnants of Rathke's pouch. Usually these cysts are lined by a columnar type of epithelium. They may have cilia. Oftentimes we'll have a bit of colloid uh, in the lumen as well. Also demonstrated in this particular preparation one can see in this scanning picture is the surrounding encapsulation uh, around the adenohypothesis. So this is a low power lengthwise cut through the entire uh, pituitary gland or hypothesis. Uh, please recall that the neural hypothesis uh, consists of unmyelinated uh, nerve fibers primarily, and it will have associated uh, with it some small glial cells known as uh, pituocytes. So they're a supporting element in this infundibular stock in the neurohypophyseal uh, region. It is in this particular region, in those unmyelinated uh, fiber tracts, that one will look for and find the herring's bodies. These transport uh, packages that are carrying oxytocin, vasopressin from the paraventricular and supraopic nuclei in the hypothalamic region uh, to this area to be released. They will be complex to the protein uh, neurophysin, which is a transport, transport uh, type of protein. In this particular preparation, because it has a PAS component to it, uh, we should be able to see uh, some of the uh, herring bodies, hopefully. Now the 
various uh, epithelial cell types forming the uh, pars distalis or the anterior pituitary region uh, have a regional distribution and show a variation in number. Uh, the lateral regions uh, will contain the greatest number of somatotrophs, while corticotrophs are concentrated in the medial uh, posterior region adjacent to the pars nervosa, the posterior pituitary. Thyrotrophs tend to be concentrated more anteriorly in this uh, central region, with gonadotrophs and mammotrophs are scattered throughout the pars distalis. Now, interestingly, somatotrophs make up about 50% of the epithelial cell types, mammotrophs about 25%, corticotrophs 15 to 20%, and then the gonadotrophs make up uh, about the remaining 10% of uh, those colored uh, uh, chromophyll type of cells in the pars distalis. This represents that uh, same pituitary section uh, now seen under the uh, scanning objective of the microscope. The previous illustration was uh, sort of an eyeball view where I had the TV camera uh, on the uh, slide on a piece of paper so we could see the whole entire structure. What I'm tracing now very slowly is the infundibular stock. You'll see a number of irregularities even at this scanning uh, power. Uh, and these structures are part of the, that hypophyseal uh, portal system. So it's loaded uh, with uh, blood vessels uh, in this particular stock as well as one would anticipate. Here's a little uh, larger uh, looks perhaps a small uh, artery uh, coursing in this uh, tissue as well. So we're just tracing down, this is an artifactual separation here where the arrow is, we're just tracing down the uh, infundibular stock. Remember this is just a track system really of the hypothalamal hypophyseal tract. Over on uh, the far right-hand side, this is pars tuberellus and some connective tissue uh, coming in. And as we course along the infundibular uh, stem or stalk balloons out into the neural hypothesis, as we can see here. You can see the entire structure has a fairly decent encapsulation around it, and that will be true of the adenohypothesis as well. And there will be numerous capillaries and blood vessels coursing through uh, both organs as one would expect, because this obviously is an endocrine organ. So this is all neural hypothesis uh, that we uh, have been looking at. It looks like anastomosing whorls of connective tissue. Remember these are just unmyelinated uh, axons that have streamed down, and there is a cell type, the pituocyte, uh, in there, but that is mainly a supporting element uh, akin to the glial uh, cells of the central nervous system. At this particular point, we run into the, well, let me move it just slightly out here, here you can see the surrounding capsule quite well. These are those cysts, the remnants of Rathke's pouts going up and separating adenal and a neural hypothesis uh, primarily. There really isn't much, as far as I can tell anywhere, of a pars intermedia. Uh, that's not surprising in human tissue. Some lower forms that uh, is more of a major component, but not in the human condition. And the rest of this, though it's very hard to differentiate, you can see some orange casts of cells. Uh, these are all epithelial cells and this whole huge large structure we're just rapidly coursing by is adenohypothesis. Epithelial cells arranged in cords and plates of cells uh, and separated by an intense, very intense vascular network or capillary network and you can see some of the, even at the scanning power you can see some of the dilated vessels uh, at this particular magnification. So what we've been tracing now is all uh, adenohypothesis, that epithelial component, and then we get back into the 
uh, neural area here, or the neural hypothesis. So this is the pituitary as uh, seen with a quick scan. And now what we'll uh, do is retreat very, very briefly in an attempt to find a herring body in the neural sto uh, infundibular stock area, and then uh, look at some of the chromophiles and a chromophobe quickly with this particular staining method. This is a illustration taken at extreme magnification, and off the tip of the arrow is I'm trying to illustrate one of the herring uh, bodies, one of the very light staining ones. We have some that are staining much darker, but they simply will not resolve or photograph uh, very well on the system that I'm using. Nonetheless, hopefully you can see that this little vesicle that's coursing within an axon that's sort of pulled apart. Uh, this is what these bodies look like and hopefully you can resolve on your own screens that this unit, this little package, has contained within it uh, all, a whole host of little tiny secretory uh, granules or vesicles. That's what these herring bodies uh, look like. Uh, Neurophysin with containing the active peptides, that is oxytocin and uh, vasopressin, uh, carrying them down to the uh, axon terminal. Usually they stay in a real discreet purple uh, color, but unfortunately with the optics that I'm using here, it stains sort of a black and just a nondescript blob. Uh, this is blobby enough the way it is, uh, but it gives you an idea of what uh, uh, these structures look like. Now this is a section through the adenohypothesis once again, or the pars distalis of the adenohypothesis, staying with that trichrome uh, uh, section we've looked at, simply to illustrate very briefly basophils, which are staining this blue color and as indicated by the arrow, there's a whole cluster of them. And here you can see one of these anastomosing cords or plates. Another one is shown here. The dark staining cells, that is the granules that are staining this bluey color, are the basophils. The nondescript cells, sort of forming a gray or, uh, let's move the field a little bit, uh, either a sort of a nondescript light staining are the chromophobes. There would be some more uh, down here. So those are the chromophobes. Here's another one. Basophils because they're staining uh, sort of this bluish black color. And then ones, uh, if one moves the field a little bit, in this particular area, these are the acidophils that are standing more of an orange uh, reddish uh, color to them. Now this is that trichrome stain that is not available in the loan collection. Uh, and we'll uh, illustrate those very, very briefly. But this does show you what the early clinicians were dealing with when they uh, examine pituitaries uh, for the various cell types and uh, looking for different uh, abnormalities. They could very cleverly distinguish by using some of these uh, dyes, basophils, the numbers of them, from chromophobes, from the acidophils, the more reddish orangey uh, type staining cells in this particular preparation. The erythrocytes in the capillaries and vessels passing through here uh, stain a bright orange with this particular uh, preparation. So this gives you an idea of, of what some of these fancy uh, elaborately stained uh, preparations actually look like. More or less now from a historical point of view because uh, most routine or most modern laboratories now routinely use the antibodies for specific identification of cell types. Well, once again, here are the chromophobes, a whole a host of them. These again would be uh, basophils and uh, maybe a couple of acidophils uh, at this particular location. 
Now this is a section of the pars distalis or adenohypothesis from the preparation in the loan collection of the student boxes, showing uh, quite crisply in this section acidophils. We can't tell which uh, subcategory, uh, somatotrophs or mammotrophs. We just can only say that these are acidophils. This group of sort of gray looking type of cells rather than blue are the basophils. Once again, one, not, one cannot determine whether these are corticotropes, thyrotropes, or gonadotropes. We can only say that they are of the basophil uh, group with this particular hematoxylin and eosin stain. So this gives you an idea of acidophils, basophils, and routine preparation, and then non-stained cells such as the one indicated at the tip of the pointer uh, would be a chromophobe. One of the epithelial cells of the adenohypophysis usually exhausted of granules and therefore it does not stain. So that was a pretty good uh, cluster of uh, a comparison of acidophils, basophils, and chromophobes from the specimen in the loan collection. Now again, this is a, another region from the loan collection uh, of the adenohypothesis from a little bit different region uh, at a lower power magnification. To emphasize the anatomical structure of the pars distalis, made up of clumps or cords of cells that will contain, that is, the three cell types, acidophils, basophils, or chromophobes. As important as that is, note the vasculature, which is the key to all of the endocrine uh, glands. Notice the intensity of the vasculature. The uh, vessels here are empty, large bore dilated capillaries. This one happens to contain a few erythrocytes. And look at the spacing. This gives uh, one the impression that these cells are almost suspended in their cords and plates in a sea of blood plasma that's flowing through and around these cords, which is indeed the case. Uh, a very, very vascular tissue in which, in addition to the cell types, uh, makes the identification of the adenohypothesis uh, fairly straightforward. So it's a very, very vascular structure uh, and the whole key to understanding the function of the uh, adenohypothesis and its relationship to the neurohypothesis in the uh, hypothalamic region and its connections to the brain is realizing this very, very vascular uh, interconnection uh, between these two subcomponents. Uh, and here it shows you the uh, intense nature, if I can use that term, the intense vascular arrangement uh, around these uh, epithelial cords and plates, so characteristic of the uh, pars distalis. Now, as mentioned previously, most modern clinics uh, today rather than using the stains, though it's good for sort of an introduction or an arbitrary uh, look, now have antibodies to each of the five probes. Routinely, uh, University of Missouri uh, hospital and clinics have antibodies that they run routinely on these situations to uh, human growth hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, ACTH, prolactin, FSH, and LH. Uh, so they run, will actually run those specific antibodies and do an immunohistochemical uh, staining. Now what you see in the field of view here, and I thought it would be of interest uh, to uh, illustrate this, is a section of human pituitary that I uh, got from the uh, clinic that was stained to illustrate immunohistochemically a growth hormone. So those epithelial cell types that have this blackish granulation to them, that is the antibodies labeling the actual uh, 
growth hormone, remember this is one of the most numerous ones, uh, is illustrating that fact, uh, and this, how these, this is how the uh, immunohistochemistry appears when you examine uh, the slides. So this particular cro uh, chromophore here, we can definitely say contains growth hormone because it's filled with the uh, label labeling uh, that particular peptide. And you can see there are other epithelial cells that don't stain, so they're one of the other types of the uh, trophic cells, those epithelial cells uh, within the uh, pituitary. So this is growth hormone, or the, uh, the somatotrophs. This is a field of mammotrophs, those, that is those that are staining uh, darkly. Uh, stain to illustrate prolactin in a human pituitary. This uh, particular field has been stained immunohistochemically to uh, show ACTH. So uh, these are the adrenal cortical corticotrophs, uh, some of the basophils, but are uh, being illustrated here. Note that they are lesser number as compared to the somatotrophs and the uh, mammotrophs, which are by far the most numerous uh, of the uh, epithelial cells of the adenohypophysis. Here we're getting into uh, a little bit denser concentration of the corticotrophs, which are staining uh, brownish-black uh, due to the histochemical uh, labeling reaction. A bit of human pituitary once again, uh, stained for uh, FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, and you can see their appearance as brown-black like the other immunohistochemical uh, staining probes. Uh, they all look the same. You just have to know the name of the probe uh, in this particular human pituitary. Note, too, the intense vasculature that's coming in in these anastomosing cords and plates. This is showing up uh, quite well in this uh, particular human pituitary. Uh, and once again, simply to illustrate immunohistochemically, uh, scattered cells showing the immunohistochemical reaction. Uh, so it's a probe dir of, uh, directly attaching and marking an, by an antibody uh, follicle-stimulating hormone. And finally, uh, immunohistochemical probe using the same technique to demonstrate LH, uh, luteinizing hormone, and its position within these uh, epithelial cords, identified once again by the immunohistochemical reaction. So this would be, uh, these would be gonadotrophs, but gonadotrophs containing a, uh, the LH uh, type of glycoprotein. So with the use of these immunohistochemical probes, one can differentiate between the different types of basophils, that is, those that gonadotrophs and whether they're FSH or LH producing, the uh, thyrotropes or the corticotropes. Likewise, the same technique can be used to differentiate between the acidophils, uh, that is, uh, growth hormone or somatotrophs, growth hormone producing cells, or the mammotrophs that are going to be producing uh, prolactin.